put some questions together. Um, one thing I want you to be thinking about is that um, unless an exam or a quiz or any of that says specifically that it wants you to do it completely on your own, um, you can access your materials. So maybe you have um, a study guide, maybe you have flashcards that you want to have. Um, for the PowerPoint that I share, I put um, all the information, all the concepts I'm going to cover in alphabetical order on like the third slide so that you know where to go within um, that PowerPoint. So these are all different things that you can have to study. Obviously we're thinking about the timeline as well. So if a, like in this case, the quiz says, you know, oh, it's 45 minutes. Um, we do want to be cognizant of that and think about how much time we're spending, but we also should feel comfortable um, just exploring and seeing how we're doing, like utilize those resources. There may be ones where you don't need a resource and so you're not taking that extra time on it. So let's look at this first one. In the following sentence, one of the three words is misspelled. So we're going to glance at those and see what we can see. So scientists believe that he is the oldest mummy found as he dates back to the copper age. So copper is definitely spelled with two P's and you notice that we're capitalizing because it's a time period. Mummy, um, yes, that's how we spell the mummy, the, the found object of um, a preserved body, but believe, um, I is typically before E, so we would mark believe. Um, in this case, we're looking for the right verb to go in parentheses. Again, this is something that um, in this particular instance, I'm horrible at this one. I have never figured out exactly which one goes where. So um, don't feel badly about that kind of thing. Do your best in this instance. Have your flashcard, have your information beside you to glance at, and know that um, a spelling, spell check, or grammar check, or Grammarly, or Perla, those kind of things are going to support you in finding this. So in this case, the girl said, that she had been having difficulty sleeping, laying awake because she feared the dark. So we'd go with that second one. But it's not something that I knew offhand. I guessed laying, and then when I looked at it, I was like, oh, thank goodness I got it right. But it's just not something that has ever clicked in my head. Don't um, feel badly about that. There may be things that you're really good at that make sense, and then there are, of course, going to be details that are just difficult. And this is one for me that I just, I, I don't know that I'm ever getting there. I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to keep putting that on my list of trying to learn. Um, in this case, we're looking at our verbs again. So one thing that we want to watch in a long sentence like this is that perhaps there are other words that will clue us in as to which one we want. How many times have you swore or sworn to yourself? So I like to also say this aloud. How many times have you swore to yourself? How many times have you sworn to yourself? So in this case, I would go with sworn. Um, that's the wrong um, verb type right there. So again, we're looking for those. We're doing our best. We're trying. And this one, we have a really interesting point that you're going to find a lot of times. And on the PowerPoint, we talk about how we will have a subject. So the subject matter, matter is our subject, and we're looking for a matching verb. But there's information between your subject and the verb. And what happens with these is that we look at whatever is closest to the verb, which in this case, fables is the object of the preposition. We can read this sentence without that. And if we look at subject matter is, we would have the right verb. But if we looked at fables, fables are plural, and so fables are. So we have to watch for things like prepositions so that we mark out that prepositional phrase and don't get caught in it. So in this case, we're looking at matter as a subject of our sentence, and it is singular, and is becomes our correct word to choose. A crowd of observers almost never a role in his stories. So here's another one. A, it has of observers, so it's got all these extra words, it has a negative, has um, an object of the preposition, and a preposition, so we have this prepositional phrase. We have all these words between crowd, the subject, and whichever verb we're going to pick. But crowd is one of those little ones to get in the way and cause problems. Some words that describe a large group are seen as collective nouns. So a crowd is perceived as a collective, as a single entity. So while there are a lot of whatever this crowd is, this crowd of observers, there are a lot of people presumably in it. We don't see it as a bunch of people, a 
a fair number of people. Instead, we see it as a cohesive group. So it, instead of they, if we're going to look at our verb, it has a role in his stories. It almost never has a role in his stories. So has is what we're looking at. If we were looking at observers, again, where we see that plural, they have, and it would throw us off. So A, we're looking for the subject, not everything that's in the middle, and B, we're watching for some really interesting cases like crowd. We also get that with things like family and group, and we have to watch those numbers. In each pair, click on the word group that is a complete sentence, not a run-on. So you'll see that as we go through, I like to sort of glance and see what's matching until I figure out what is different. So as I'm going through here, oh, there we go. That's what's different. So that's what we're going to be watching for. Obama's father received a master's degree in economics from Harvard University. He later became an economist in his native Kenya. Oh, this looks like two separate sentences, two independent clauses. I could read the second one by itself. He later became an economist in his native Kenya. That makes perfect sense. Obama's father received a master's degree in economics from Harvard University. Again, that makes perfect sense. So to not have any punctuation between them, it's just a run-on sentence. It's squishing two independent clauses together. However, a semicolon is a great way to divide them. We, call it, we could also use a comma with a joining word. So we could put comma after university and put something like all and um, between them. So comma and would work well. But in this case, we have um, a semicolon. So that's perfect. In this case, we're looking for words that help us with logic and clarity. Our dog was neither interested in nor bothered by. And again, shouldn't we start looking for what is matching and what isn't? Whoops, there it is right here in the middle. So let's see what that is. Our dog was neither interested in nor bothered by the kitten that we brought home from the animal shelter. Our dog was neither interested nor bothered by the kitten. Ah, so what's happening here is that we have two sort of phrases, interested in, bothered by. But this one says interested nor bothered. So that means by goes for both of them. Let's, let's test that out and see if it works. Interested by nor bothered by. Oh, that doesn't work. We need this in to make sense. So this is the one um, that is not missing any words, and we go with that first one. Sometimes we have to divide things, so look for words like nor and or. Um, look for and, um, because that means we're joining parts together, and we always want that parallel structure. So interested in, bothered by, we have ed verbs, and then we have the connective word beside them. Um, in this case, we're looking for the word or phrase in a sentence that can be omitted, and we won't lose any meaning. The lake near our summer house is larger than Swift's pond. I always like to read them without information just to see what it sounds like, so let's try it without in, um, this part. The lake is larger in size than Swift's pond. Well, well, this one tells me about where the lake is, but this one says larger in size. If it's larger, isn't that size, size and large? Those kind of go together. We say, what size soda do you want? A small, medium, or a large? And so that's not really adding to the sentence. So we're gonna click this as a word that we could get rid of and it won't bother what we're doing. The lake near our summer house, this gives us great information, is larger than Swift's pond. And each pair click on the sentence again, that's not missing anything. The Nile is longer, oops, Look again, so look at this. We're matching, we're matching, and then we stop matching. So that's the area we're going to focus on. The Nile is longer, but not as voluminous, voluminous as the Amazon River. I have so much trouble with this word. The Nile is longer than, but not as voluminous, voluminous as the Amazon River. Ooh, this is giving us great details. Um, it's longer than, so that's giving us a comparative, which we need in this sentence. So it's saying in this instance, it's longer, but in that it's not as. So we're getting two comparatives. I'm gonna go with that second one because it's very clear. Um, these are different comparatives, the volume and the length. So we need a complete phrase for each one. So a lot of these kinds, we're gonna be looking for things like than and that, that restrict or define exactly what we're talking about. 
in this case, we're looking for that end punctuation, and we're going to have three choices. So we're looking for, is it a question? We're looking for, is it dramatic, intense, important, exciting? Or is it a statement um, that could be an imperative saying, go do something? It could just be a statement of fact, um, a declarative or imperative. Easy to operate and almost noiseless, the boats were popular with famous figures such as Thomas Edison and Andrew Carnegie. Um, I don't think that sounds very exciting. It's definitely not a question, so we're going to put a period there. And again, we're looking at punctuation, but this time it's there, and we have to figure out which one is right. Annoyed by the hoots, screams, and splashes, so this is looking good right here. We have our commas between our items. From the Dixon's pool party, this looks good with our um, plural family name with an apostrophe hanging off the end. Carla went to the window and yelled, do you know what time it is? At one of his concerts, James Galway pulled out two cheap tin horns from his pockets and played a different tune on each one simultaneously. So one thing that I thought of when I looked at this one is whether or not we would end with this question mark, because a lot of times we will, um, we're, we're watching that space. Like, should it be um, a period for all of it? Should it be a question? And this is appropriate because she is asking a question and we end her question as an end to the sentence, um, even though we have sort of a declarative sentence and then we have a question buried within it. But that is fitting. This is what caught my attention here. We have a list of adjectives that describe a noun. So they describe the horns and we don't always put commas between them. It really depends. So we would want to look up, you know, where am I putting my commas between a list of adjectives? Because sometimes we need them, sometimes we don't. And in this case, we have two, cheap, ten. So since we have three of them, why do we only have one comma? I'm thinking we probably don't need any. Depending on how we put them together, we may not need any commas. And so that one is making me nervous. So I'm going to go with this one, annoyed that it is correctly punctuated. Again, with the punctuation, um, good technique does not guarantee, however, that the power you develop will be sufficient for kyokpa competition. This has me asking questions, so let's check our next one and see if perhaps it's right, and then we can move on. Maria, not Sylvia, was chosen to play Ophelia. So if something, if a phrase is between two commas, um, it could be the start of a sentence and a comma, it could be... Um, halfway through a sentence and the end, but if it has that, it means we can not say it and still understand what's happening. So let's not say that and read the sentence. Maria was chosen to play Ophelia. That's all the information we need. That's perfect. So this one is correctly punctuated. And I think the part that's got me here with the however, we could look up how do we use however, how do we join two sentences. That is a restrictive clause. So um, I'm wondering exactly what I would do. I think there are a couple of changes I'd make. So in this one, we are looking for using quotation marks appropriately with other punctuation. So we have our quotation marks and we have our period and then at the very end, that's looking good. And so it looks like what happens is right here in the middle. So sometimes we don't put anything. Sometimes we put a comma and sometimes we use a colon. So because we're setting it up as needing more information. So if this was a sentence on its own, um, and it was complete. We, we, it's not complete now. Stephen Leacock once said, we obviously need more information. So if it was complete, we could put a colon and have our um, quotation. So that's definitely not happening here. And so we need to decide if we need a comma or not. And generally, when we say something like he said, or she said, or they did, they stated, we're going to use that comma. So in this case, I'm going to go for the second sentence because we often put that space there. But again, look for those things that are different, and then you could Google or search um, comma with a quote, APA, what does that look like? And that would help us see examples. Um, again, we're looking for punctuation correctly, and we're gonna see what matches. Some examples of reptiles are lizards, oops, there it is. That's slightly different, so let's see what's happening are lizards, snakes, crocodiles, and turtles. So this looks good. We have each one of um, the list sort of items divided by a comma and and with the last one. 
but this is where we have to ask some questions. Are we looking at setting up a list? So is this a sentence complete? The same way we were talking about the quote. We can put that, that colon right there if we're setting up information that is just extra. So let's read this without that. Some examples of reptiles are that's not a sentence. We need to know what those examples are. So examples needs a direct object. That lets us know that this is not correct because if we had that, that colon and we didn't need what's afterwards, it would read perfectly well on this left side. And it doesn't. Some examples of reptiles are lizard snakes and it goes straight into that. So we would pick our first one. And each pair click on the version of the sentence in which all parts fit together grammatically. So let's see what's happening here. Um, they're very different, but on the same topic. The purpose of the Japanese garden in City Hall Plaza inspires peace and reflection. Now let's read the next one. The Japanese garden in City Hall Plaza inspires peace and reflection. So one thing that I want us to do, the same that we often do, is I want us to not pay attention to these um, prepositional phrases. So of the Japanese garden, we're going to ignore it. In City Hall Plaza, we're going to ignore that. And we're going to do the same here. And we're going to read our sentence without those prepositional phrases. The purpose inspires peace and reflection. Can a purpose do that? The Japanese garden inspires peace and reflection. So just by checking it out without those prepositional phrases, a garden could inspire peace and reflection, but a purpose doesn't do that. That's not how that works. So we would go with this bottom one as the correct one. In this case, again, we're looking for things like parallelism. We want the one that doesn't contain errors. Parallelism can be in items in a list. It can be um, verbs that go together. It can be um, tense, making sense from one space to the next. I often look for ed, ing verbs. Those are things that we can often catch. So let's see if we find some. And of course, I'm going back and forth to see that they all match and where exactly the issue is going to arise. Michael discovered that buying and maintaining a house were more expensive, so it's all the same so far, than to pay paying. Okay, that's where it's different. Than to pay rent on his apartment. So remember that ing thing? Um, this one has ing, ing, so does that one, but this one shifts, and so that's what we're looking at. Why shift that? Why make that not parallel? Why would we want to do that? We wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> so we'll pick the second one because we have Michael discovered that buying and maintaining a house were, so were is the verb going with this plural subject. They were buying and maintaining more expensive than paying rent on his apartment. This one we're looking for the better version. What has more information? What is clearer? What doesn't have issues with parallelism or has correct verbs? That kind of thing. So again, let's see what's same and what's different. Children whose birthdays fall on a holiday, such as the 4th of July, and that's where we start to change, may not get enough attention on their special day. It may prevent them from getting enough attention on their special day. So in this case, it is talking about the 4th of July. But that's not what we're talking about, are we? We're talking about children and their birthdays and holidays in general. So children whose birthdays fall on a holiday, they may not get enough attention. So we're going to go with that first one. Um, it may prevent them. It, the holiday, the holiday doesn't stop you in a sense. It's people's reactions to that holiday. So that takes us in the wrong direction. Um, click on the version of the sentence, which all the parts fit together again. When students first move to college, may, so that's where our differences is, may be a period of homesickness. When students first move to college, they may experience homesickness. So what's different here is that this one, the second one, points out effectively with when and the comma that it is a dependent clause. When makes it a dependent clause. And we need that comma afterwards. And then we're going to need a subject and a verb and quite possibly a direct object and all of that. So that's what's happening with our second sentence. We could read this sentence without that information. A dependent clause is often removable. They may experience homesickness. And then that clause gives us lots of great new information. When students first move to college, they may experience homeless, homesickness. So we would go with the second one. 
our final example from these, um, click on the version in which all modifiers clearly and logically refer to the word they modify. This is really important in the sense that um, if something gets too far away from all the other parts, it can say something we don't intend. So again, we're going to match things. Working with local mud and other materials, inexpensive Whoops, look at that. That's where it's going to be different. Inexpensive houses that are practical in a hot climate can be constructed. So this goes back to an idea in the PowerPoint about who is doing something. Do houses do things or do builders do things? Do things. Working with local mud and other materials, builders can construct inexpensive houses that are practical in a hot climate. So in this case, we are combated between builders working with these materials and houses working with these materials. And a house can't work and a builder can't. So we're going to go with that second one. So make sure that you are looking for these differences and then look up those kinds of things. When you see something like that, you can say, well, who is being um, acted upon or doing the acting. And a house can't try to visualize. Um, in this case, I visualize houses trying to pick things up and <laughs> it's not working. And here we have builders who are capable. So visualizing things, um, asking those questions when you see what part is different can be really great steps.